Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for, for waiting. We've, we've had a tremendous response to this webinar, and uh, there's still quite a few participants coming in, so, so thank you for your patience. But I think we should um, make a start, as we do have a, a long agenda and some, some great speakers. So good morning and good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from, and, and thank you very much for joining the webinar today. This is being organized under the auspices of the Asia Protected Areas Partnership, or APAP for short. My name is Scott Perkin. I'm the head of the Science and Strategy Group with the IUCN Asia Regional Office, and I'm based in Bangkok. And it's uh, my pleasure to be your, your facilitator today. So the, the title of today's webinar is Digital Technology to Conserve Nature insights for future protected area management. And sometimes technology is seen as, as being in opposition to conservation, but increasingly we're coming to realize that technology can actually be a powerful ally. Amongst other uses, it can help with law enforcement, it can help with habitat mapping, it can help with wildlife monitoring, the mitigation of human wildlife conflict, can help us analyze large amounts of data very rapidly. And these are just a few of the possibilities. Uh, next slide, please. So today's webinar has really been designed to, to introduce us to some of these different possibilities. Uh, and we have a really fantastic lineup of different speakers. We'll kick off uh, the webinar with an overview presentation from Mr. Devaya Ayama, who's the community manager of the IUCN Green List of Protected and Conserved Areas based in IUCN headquarters in Switzerland. And he'll tell us about the Tech for Nature project, which is a, a global initiative which is being implemented under the IUCN Huawei partnership. And then we'll have a series of country case studies uh, from South Asia, the Republic of Korea, China, and Thailand, um, all exploring different aspects of using technology in conservation in different contexts. Next slide, please. So I hope you'll enjoy the, sem the, the seminar and uh, I hope you'll find it useful to your own work in protected areas. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have in the chat room, and we'll try to address those during the uh, question and answer sessions. I would kindly request that you keep your microphone on mute uh, and your video camera turned off uh, unless you're speaking. We do have quite a, a large number of people on the webinar today, so uh, it's important to uh, keep our microphones on mute. Uh, we will be posting the presentations on the APAP website uh, following the webinar, so you will have a chance to go back and revisit those if they're of interest and you would like to take more time to, to study some of them in greater detail. And finally, I just wanted to let you know that we will be recording the webinar uh, for our records. So, as I said, we have a very full agenda and quite a short uh, time slot. So uh, I'll stop there and I propose that we, we get started. And I'd like to invite Mr. Uh, Devaya Ayama to, uh, to give his presentation on Tech for Nature. So Dev, uh, over to you. Hi, Scott, and good morning from Europe. Good afternoon, everyone. Just checking, Scott, that you can hear me fine. We can hear you, Dev. We don't have your presentation yet, but we can hear you loud and clear. And you can see me okay? And now we can see you. Okay, I may, uh, yeah, I'm gonna share my screen and in case my connection is not the strongest, I may switch my video off during the presentation. And can you just confirm, Scott, that you can see my full screen? Looking good, Dev. OK, great. OK, hi, everyone. Um, 
as Scott said, I'm with uh, IUCN's Protected Areas Program. Uh, my name is Davaya Ayama. I'm part of the global IUCN Green List team. I'm also the project manager for a new uh, Tech for Nature project. That's a, a partnership collaboration between IUCN and Huawei. IUCN and Huawei uh, for exploring technology solutions in nature conservation. Without further ado, I'm going to dive in in the interest of time. I will um, be keeping uh, um, this quite this presentation to a sort of summary of the of the project. It's a fairly new project. Uh, I do see in the agenda that we have some time for Q and A, so we um, we can get into some detail uh, there. Very quickly, just as a as a reminder, I think most of you joining this webinar and as members of APAP, you know uh, who IUCN is. It, um, just as a reminder, it's the world's largest environmental network with over 1,400 member organizations. 200 plus of those are from government uh, and government agencies and states. Um, over 1,100 of those are from civil society, non-governmental organizations, and in indigenous people's organizations. As a quick background to who Huawei is as a, as a leading global provider of ICT technology, um, they're involved both with hardware and software related to information and communications technology. They're also committed to uh, digital inclusiveness and the Tech for Nature project uh, falls under their Tech for All uh, Sustainable Development Initiative, um, which um, essentially looks at focusing on three key areas of technology applications and skills um, to make sure that um, digital technology is inclusive um, to national and global societies. And one of its main purposes is to help accelerate the UN sustainable development goals. So, in the middle of 2020, um, Huawei and IUCN well, started some initial discussions. Uh, Huawei was interested in um, having a global, more of a global program on um, nature conservation, and uh, they sought out IUCN as a as a potential partner. And from these discussions, a Tech for Nature global project um, was initiated. It's a three-year project starting, which started at the end of uh, last year and runs till the end of September 2023. The vision of which is to scale up success in nature conservation through digital technology innovation. And the goal is that by the end of the initial three-year project duration, the partnership um, will enable more than 300 protected areas worldwide to assess and evaluate nature conservation success. So these areas will secure habitats and ecosystems that provide benefits uh, to local communities through fair and effective management and monitoring activities. And a key part of this project is that these management and monitoring activities will be measured against the IUCN Green List. And I'll summarize very quickly uh, what the ice and green list is for those of you that may be uh, new to the ice and green list, but hopefully you've heard um, a little bit about it. Um, and the idea is that 300 protected areas will, will be engaged with implementing the ice and green list standard and about a third of those will achieve IUC and green list certification. The success of the project will be recognized um, and promoted at various global and regional events, including IUCN's World Conservation Congress in September, the CBD uh, conference of parties uh, later this year, as well as the Asia Parks Congress next year. Very quickly, the, the IUCN Green List's mission is to increase and recognize the number of effective, protected and conserved areas globally. So it's equally important for the, for the Green List not just to recognize areas that are effectively managed and governed, but also to increase the number of areas uh, that are effective. The main objective of the green list of protected and conserved areas is that it's the first global standard of best practice for area-based conservation. 
And it's a program of certification for protected and conserved areas that are effectively managed and fairly governed. What does effective mean in the IOC and greenness context? It's that protected or conserved area, the protected or conserved areas that ultimately achieve the IOC and green list are demonstrating that they're fairly and equitably governed, that they're effectively managed, including making connectivity considerations at a landscape or seascape scale, that they're successfully achieving conservation outcomes of all major site values, and that they're providing the evidence to demonstrate the successful achievement and that they're responding actively to climate change challenges and global sustainability goals uh, in terms of their contributions to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I won't get into the detail of the standard, but just in terms of how the Irish and Green List measures effectiveness performance, uh, the heart of the Green List is, is a global standard. It's four components around good governance, sound design and planning, effective management, and successful conservation outcomes. There are 17 criteria or conditions that protected areas must meet. Um, and underlying these 17 criteria are about 50 indicators. Uh, the main focus is really around at the criteria level. And in order for any area to meet the Irish and Greenness, it must meet all 17 criteria. So getting back to Tech for Nature, there's three main work packages, um, three main work areas. Uh, the first one is around nature conservation at five flagship sites. And these are about engaging five key prote protected or conserved areas, um, identifying a tech solution, and implementing the greenest standard, or using the greenest standard to um, to apply improvements. The second area is the broader target of 300 uh, protected areas, and this will include the development um, of knowledge products, leveraging the technology solution experience from the flagship sites as well as um, additional sites beyond the flagship sites. And as I mentioned, it's about um, the aim is to to um, to have technology solutions help these sites achieve green list certification, at least a third of those sites. And I talked about so, um, uh, promoting and visibility at, public, at events. In terms of the global scope, there are five flagship countries. So in Asia, we have China and Thailand. In Europe, we have Spain and Switzerland, and we also have Mauritius in the Western Indian Ocean. Um, the green countries here are the flagship countries. Um, they're meant to, to showcase innovation to a larger set of countries that we're engaging through IUCN offices and Huawei offices. As a new project, we're also open to, to new partners that are um, interested in, the tech for, in, in contributing to the Tech for Nature vision and goal. So partners that are interested to commit to implement the ice and green list with innovative tech solutions, uh, yeah, please yeah. Do, do feel free to get in touch with, with me and my, I'll provide my email address at the end. Very quickly to give you an idea of the flagship countries, uh, the key theme I would say in terms of project design is, is that there's diversity. So uh, across the flagship countries, we are dealing with various uh, themes, um, including um, monitoring and manage and successful management um, of um, globally threatened species. Um, we've got one flagship site that has uh, that is a marine ecosystem. Uh, several flagship sites are forest ecosystems. So understanding what kind of technologies are relevant for for different types of ecosystems, and uh, we've also got several sites in Europe in. Um, in the Alps, uh, this, um, in Switzerland and Spain, uh, that are looking at what kind of technologies um, are relevant for mountain ecosystems. Um, just as I mentioned, the Tech for Nature is a new project that kicked off at the end of last year. Uh, for the first two quarters of 2021, we've really focused on establishing the, the five flagship country projects. And um, I'm going to very quickly give you an idea of the of the types of technology solutions that are that are being discussed. Um, well, sorry, that are being set up um, and will be tested um, starting um, in this quarter uh, and getting in uh, through the project duration. Uh, but overall, the the idea is to engage with site managers and site staff. Uh, also, it's important for IUCN to engage uh, with local stakeholders. Um, and in each country, identify uh, suitable partners um, beyond just the IUCN office um, or regional office and, and the Huawei office. Uh, so um, if there are IUCN member organizations that are interested, um, 
that's all um, we also partner uh, with them starting with the flagship countries in europe as i mentioned it's switzerland and spain uh, we're working in the swiss national park that was uh, green listed earlier this year in 2021 the main area of work is around improving wildlife monitoring and um, the Swiss National Park has um, a, a rather extensive network of camera traps. This map on the right hand side shows you a grid of camera traps that uh, collects um, thousands of camera trap images uh, per year. So they've got a database of about 500,000 to one to one. Actually, it currently it's about 1.5 million, but it, um, the, um, per year it's somewhere between 500,000 to 1 million images that are added to this database. Uh, so there's a huge um, human resource um, dimension to processing uh, this large database of images and it can take um, that can take time so the potential solution is to identify to test a proof of concept for an artificial intelligence algorithm that can process at least a first screening um, possibly more through machine learning in terms of identifying which images um, out of these, this large number of camera trap images would be uh, suitable um, for further analysis. Because uh, as we know, camera trap images can, um, can collect uh, a lot of images, not all of which will have um, wildlife um, in it. And then the idea is to see if, um, if there is a successful alg algorithm, um, whether that can be built into a, a wildlife cam um, uh, that then is only sending in um, relevant images that have um, images of interest um, to a central uh, data compilation point. They're also looking at uh, data connectivity for data transmission in the park. Uh, in Spain, we're looking at we're working in four national parks, and uh, the objective is to identify ongoing management and monitoring practices around tourism fluxes and negative impacts on conservation values from high visitation. So in, um, in the COVID context during the pandemic, some of these parks uh, received uh, a huge increase in local visitation. Um, and the idea here is, is to do feasibility assessments to identify cost effective solutions to monitor visitation and their potential um, impacts uh, on park values. You know, in all of the cases, the park will commit to the ice and green list. In Thailand, there are two national parks that are part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, the Dong Pai and Khao Forest Complex. Uh, here, the idea is to improve threat monitoring, looking at digital solutions for improved evaluation of threat reduction, um, with poaching, uh, including poaching and linkages to SMART, which is the spatial monitoring and reporting tool. Uh, which is a powerful software application that improves the ability of protected area agencies to combat poaching and other legal activities. In this case, also a large amount of information is generated um, and the objective is to see whether um, AI or cloud-based computing can help with processing that information. Again, both parks have committed, to, um, will be committing to the green list. In China, the project will work with Hainan Tropical Rainforest National Park and they'll be using acoustic and digital technologies to support the conservation of the critically endangered Hainan Kibben, uh, using sound recordings um, to track um, population movement uh, and behavior, uh, also looking at connectivity issues once these sound recordings are generated, other options to transmit this, these recordings to a central database. And we will be exploring both cloud-based and AI technologies and the parks also committed to green list. Lastly, and um, just wrapping up here as I see I'm uh, out, out of getting out of time, um, the, the flagship, the last flagship country is, is Mauritius. This is the marine ecosystem um, that, I, that I mentioned. There's a site um, that's currently an unprotected area, but has high visitation from tourists because it does have high marine biodiversity with a lot of cor coral um, biodiversity. Uh, but as a result of it being unprotected, there is a lot of degradation. Um, so there's um, uh, plans for cor coral rehabilitation um, using the, the, the coral diversity that can help with, uh, with, with rehabilitation efforts um, and to deploy um, a camera system that can help with live viewing um, to increase public awareness. Um, 
of the state of corals in Mauritius, uh, as well as for monitoring um, both uh, existing coral reefs, uh, as well as efforts for coral reef uh, restoration. Uh, the idea here will also be the, to use the greenness standard to, um, to facilitate protection of the area through a conserved area category. Um, just in, in closing, some of the, the, the themes that we're seeing in, in the Tech for Nature project, as you've seen across this diversity of flagship sites, um, are, well, the, the large theme is around technology solutions um, to support protected areas implementing uh, the areas in green list. Um, and then these tend to relate to cloud-based data management um, and improved efficiency of data management, um, which doesn't always have to include artificial uh, intelligence or machine learning, but in, um, in many cases it does, but also um, just the use of a cloud-based platform uh, can help with, with uh, improved uh, data management. We're also looking at mobile technology, including apps that can be used on, on mobile phones as well as data connectivity within, within a park. Um, and really the idea is about testing proof of concepts and then leveraging that to, to share with the greenness community and the broader uh, global regional protected area communities. Um, and then also providing guidance on the appropriate use of technology uh, for inclusiveness um, in terms of fair governance and effectiveness in terms of successful conservation outcomes. With that, I will hand it back to you, Scott. I thank everyone for their attention and my contact information is here on this last screen. Thank you. That's great, thank you very much, Dev. Um, I think it's uh, a really great introduction to the, the different ways in which technology can be used in support of conservation. Uh, we haven't had any uh, questions in the chat as yet, so I think we'll, we'll move along. Um, but I do invite all participants to, to post your questions in the chat, and uh, we will try to address those during the, uh, the question and answer session. So I'd now like to invite Dr. Aditya Gangadharan to uh, give his presentation, uh, looking at the use of uh, technology to uh, help mitigate human wildlife conflict in, uh, in South Asia. So um, Dr. Aditya has uh, had a long history of working with uh, innovative solutions involving technology uh, and uh, was recently working with IUCN as our sub-regional support officer for monitoring the illegal killing of elephants uh, and so has a, a particular interest in elephants. Um, but today he's speaking to us in his capacity as co-founder of the Wildlife Innovation Lab. Um, so I will now hand over to, to Aditya, please. Thank you, Scott. Um, so just to confirm, you can see my screen. Uh, yes, no, you can yes, hear me? We can hear you and we can see your screen. Aditya. Okay, cool. Um, you just minimize this and okay. So uh, thank you, Scott. Um, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Happy to be here today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about conser uh, conservation technology, particularly in the context of human wildlife conflict, which, you know, we know it's quite a huge problem throughout the world, and particularly in areas where you have lots of biodiversity and as well as lots of people. So uh, the problem is that using technology in mitigating anything related to human wildlife conflict or in any kind of wildlife, uh, wildlife uh, purpose is quite challenging. It's not at all an easy thing to deal with. Um, there's, there's a few fundamental, I guess, contradictions in a sense, uh, when you try to integrate things like technology, wildlife, uh, farming communities, particularly in rural areas, and particularly doing this in any kind of a cohesive way that is sort of logical and doesn't sort of, uh, it's not full of contradictions in itself. So uh, some of the things that make this quite challenging are things such as the power gap between the persons or the, the entities that provide the technologies and the beneficiaries of these technologies. Uh, this is particularly so when you have, for example, uh, donor-based systems or technology uh, 
companies that are providing these and the beneficiaries who are typically uh, rural communities in uh, forested areas, uh, perhaps without uh, that much of uh, um, exposure to these technologies or that much power uh, in negotiating how these are used. Um, there's issues in how do you, when you have a technology intervention that's put in place, how do you integrate it into existing systems of, of administration, of management? Uh, how does it really fit in? Uh, is it you know, creating new uh, verticals in itself or is it integrating in some way that enhances the existing system? Uh, and then of course, there's the whole issue of sustainability. Uh, and that I think uh, lots of people who have tried this would have seen this, that how do you ensure that whatever you set up uh, really doesn't end up as just a pile of uh, junk uh, at the end of the project, because typically we're dealing with projects that have short time periods, uh, but then the system, the problems that you're dealing with are much more long-term. And so how do you reconcile those, particularly uh, with technologies that are uh, implemented und under pretty harsh field conditions? So, I mean, I, I obviously don't have answers to all of that, but uh, I can talk a little bit about a framework that uh, I find useful for thinking about questions like this. Um, there's basically four major questions. Of course, there's lots of questions, but these four I think are quite important. Um, these include things like who initiates the project, uh, who designs the technology, who implements it, and who keeps it going. So when you talk about who initiates the project, that's where we're really talking about the driving force uh, behind a conservation technology uh, implementation. Where is the commitment coming from? Who is doing the commitment? Uh, where is the ownership of the entire project? And that kind of thing is really important in determining whether it works or not. And if it works, whether it sustains or not. Um, who designs the technology? This is quite important in terms of whether what is being implemented is actually relevant to the situation on the ground at that particular site um, and or whether it just doesn't really, it's not a good fit for that particular place. Uh, and there's of course issues of intellectual property and things like that. Is it a very proprietary thing? Is it open source? All those kind of issues come up here. Um, in terms of implementing the technology, this is something where I actually feel there's um, lots of opportunities for building local capacity particularly in skills that are relevant for the 21st century economy. Um, and this is something that there's lots of interesting stuff that can be done here. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit about that. And then there's the question of sustainability. Okay, who keeps it going? Uh, you know, there's the capital cost, but then there's also the running costs. Uh, there's all the capacity building that needs to be done. There's the upgrades to the capacity that needs to keep happening. Um, and then of course, you need reinfusions of capital and things like that. So how is that going to work and how is that being planned out? So um, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of uh, case studies that I've been involved in. One was uh, an early uh, one that was, uh, this was while I was working with IUCN. And this, we implemented this in Samsi uh, in Bhutan. Uh, this was during 2018, 2019. And this was an early warning system for um, detecting um, elephant entry into crop fields and in villages. So this was initiated by IUCN and um, this, uh, like I said, 2018, 2019. Now the technology itself, which I'll get to in a minute, um, it was designed by a company called Kyari Innovations. So this is a company that, uh, it's an existing company that's based in New Delhi in India. Uh, so it's an external uh, company. Uh, and the implementation though, uh, was done in a very collaborative way uh, between the company with the forest department uh, and the local community in that area. So um, what is the technology? Essentially, it's this thing right here. It's basically an early warning system. Um, so what it does is that it just senses uh, when animals are coming close and then it sets off a sound and a light alarm. So um, there's a little bit of a deterrent function here, uh, particularly when animals are not yet habituated uh, in low density areas, it works quite well. Um, but the main thing is that it provides an early warning to farmers that the elephant is entering your uh, crop field. And so you need to get up and you know figure out what you're gonna do about it. So 
that's what this technology was. Um, and I'll just show you a video on how we implemented this. So uh, like I said, it was it's designed externally, but the product is modular. So it's shipped in, it was shipped in, uh, and the assembly was done locally uh, by the forest department and the people there. So this provided lots of opportunities for capacity building. Uh, the community then decided where these things are supposed to be placed because they know where the elephants come in, where they go out, and these were moved around periodically as well. Um, the modular nature enables uh, capacity to build, be built in maintenance and repair, um, particularly for small parts. And then there's a whole system of monitoring and evaluation to check, okay, is it actually working? How many um, times did it provide early warning? How many times did it miss? Uh, things like that. So, uh, and, and that of course is a very important part of any implementation of technology in the field um, because you really need to know, okay, is it of any use? Uh, because in lots of cases, it's really not of much use and it doesn't really help, but in some cases it does as well. So uh, what are some of the learnings from this? So this uh, implementation is what I would call a, a hybrid sort of a situation where you have products that come in externally, they are built elsewhere and they are shipped in, but it's actually uh, possible, it's, it's because it's modular, it's possible to get it assembled uh, locally. It's possible for people to gain those skills in figuring out what to do. And so that also means that whenever things go wrong, they can identify these are the parts that are, uh, that are required um, and then replace things themselves. Um, so in that sense, it's it's not quite a top-down kind of an approach. It's more of a hybrid one, uh, top-down and bottom-up. But if you go back to uh, sort of that framework that I talked about here, um, one of the things here is that a lot of the stuff comes in externally. Um, so in terms of the technology designs, for example, um, one of the issues is the whole uh, reliance on donor funding. So that brings in the capital cost, but then there's also the question of how do you uh, keep it going over the long term because uh, you know the stuff degrades in the field it gets uh, you know damaged um, and then it, it needs to be replaced so that financial sustainability is often a problem with these kind of uh, implementations uh, and that's what makes it you, you know these experiments quite important because we learn uh, by doing these things it's sort of uh, um, trial and error kind of approach in a lot of these technology implementations so if you think about sustainability as being the issue, particularly financial sustainability, then how do you build that in, uh, in a situation where long-term donor funds are not necessarily available? So some of the things you can do is bottom-up development of the technology itself, and also bring in market forces uh, to an extent wherever possible, which brings me to my second case study, which is something that I am involved in uh, currently. So this is uh, in North Bengal, India. And so what we're really trying to do here is incubate these technologies locally rather than bring them in uh, externally. So uh, this is what I'm currently doing as part of the wildlife, one of the things I'm doing uh, as part of my affiliation with the Wildlife Innovation Lab. Um, so. Here, the thing is that the technology itself is designed by individual innovators from the local community. So it's not coming in from outside, from the big city anywhere. It's designed by people who are there, who are already rooted uh, in that particular landscape. So that offers a lot of options um, to uh, leverage in terms of uh, getting things going. Uh, and the implementation, of course, is also done by the same uh, people. So, how does this work? The, the thing is that uh, lots of people living in forest dependent communities have ideas on mitigating human uh, wildlife conflict. Uh, the, you, I mean, you just walk every, anywhere along the edge of a forest and a field, you'll see all kinds of stuff. So the idea is to take these um, sort of ideas and these prototypes and provide a process of incubation for them, uh, particularly for the good ones. So this involves things like, um, support in better design, uh, fabrication facilities, uh, providing a network with skilled people who can advise them on how to make things better, um, business skills. And what all of that does is it provides a process of quality control 
uh, it's an iterative process. It gives quality to the product, which then turns it into a robust product that actually works in the field. Um, and the people who came up with these the innovators who are locally there, they can then sell the product. That's uh, you know an additional uh, income as well. Um, and it's something that they can do because they are quite part of that system. And there's a level of trust uh, in terms of others uh, from on the part of others uh, because they know these people and you know they work with them and they see them every day and all that. So there's a level of trust that sort of enhances the the, the taking up of this or the maintenance of these systems. So um, a few videos on uh, a video on the implementation of this. Um, so how it begins is that the innovators pitch their ideas to us. Uh, that these are the ideas we have, what do you think about this? And there's a process of vetting with the managers. This is really important because we put safeguards in place. So there's lots of potential for all kinds of stuff to happen. Then there's customized training, for example, in conservation technologies. Um, workshops for design thinking, rapid prototyping uh, that happen uh, along with these innovators. Uh, more specialized classes, particularly for topics that they really don't know quite well. And then there's a the process of implementing in the field. Uh, here's an example. So it's a very simple, very, very simple low cost method, but it works. Uh, and the reason it works, we know it works, is that the data is collected on this, uh, which shows that, uh, you know, the certain circumstances it works, it works for certain animals. And all of that information then come, goes into iterative improvement um, of the products. And once that is done, the testing is all done the innovators are able to sell them locally. So uh, this is the kind of uh, system that I'm currently involved in. And still, you know, it's, it's still in its early stages where uh, we've been doing this for the past three or four months, but there's a few learnings that I can perhaps share uh, today. So um, again, that framework, uh, a lot of these things are locally um, uh, motivated in the sense that the designs come locally, the implementation is local. Now that's good in terms of um, uh, having solid roots in that system and not just transplanting things from one place to another. Uh, but then there's also questions of scalability. How does that work? Because things are sort of, they're not very generalizable. They're very specific to the problems of a particular area. Um, and then of course, safeguards are quite important because uh, a lot of things can be uh, you know, the, the, all kinds of uses can be made of various things. So, um, so overall, putting these things together, uh, just a few thoughts here. Um, there's, there's different models that work for different circumstances. It's not that one model is superior to the other uh, necessarily. It's not that everything uh, that works in one place will work in another. So there's all kinds of things that can be done. Uh, there's these approaches that I would broadly classify as top-down versus bottom-up versus hybrid. Um, and each of them could work uh, well in different circumstances. Um, so it really depends on the situation. Uh, scalability and replicability are an issue in all of these implementations, actually. Um, even when you have something that's beautifully built and you know, in a very sort of commercial and very professional manner, and implemented in a place, it's not necessarily that's really going to work, it's really going to succeed. So scalability and replicability matter, or maybe they don't, I don't know, it depends. You know. um, safeguards are really important, particularly when you have ground up, uh, bottom up sort of designs being built by people. That's why we go through a process of vetting and making sure that there's proper agreements signed, uh, ensuring that people don't misuse these sort of uh, the, the, the knowledge and the facilities that are provided to them. Um, and so, but regardless of all of these, financial sustainability is really critical for all of these conservation technology. Um, I would say overall, globally, we're still at a stage where things are still in a trial and error kind of phase. They have not really, there's not very strong models in how to um, set up these system, how to keep them going, uh, how to keep them sustainable. And uh, I, I would say that using market forces is something that could uh, be useful, uh, particularly in circumstances where uh, you know it's it's it, it makes sense to do so. So um, I guess I'll just end there and uh, 
you know, that's just a video of elephants destroying a camera trap from way long ago from my uh, PhD time, but it's kind of uh, emblematic of what happens often to conservation technologies and uh, the challenges that we face um, in implementing these in the field. So um, I'll stop here and uh, I can take questions now or later, whatever, um, based on the time, um, uh, that's based on the time situation. Thank you very much, Aditya. I think that was a, a really fascinating presentation. And I think also, you know, put forward a really uh, valuable and insightful conceptual framework for looking at how we, we introduce and implement some of these technologies. Uh, maybe we have time just for a couple of quick questions. So there was one question in the chat from Sunil uh, Dubé who says, I would like to know about technologies that could be utilized by the village level administrative institutions to monitor forest and wildlife resources yearly and seasonal changes so that destruction of forest and wildlife resources due to anthropogenic activities could be checked. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Sure, there's, there's a whole range of stuff that could be used. They range from uh, remotely sensed data, which is sort of really in, from the sky up your, or sky down, you're getting a good view overall. Um, and that gives you at least at a sort of a, um, at, a, at a rough scale, what's happening? Is there degradation happening? Are there changes in the forest types? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, for more sort of uh, clear data that's on the ground, uh, there's all kinds of monitoring techniques. You could have drones that are sort of monitoring certain areas. Uh, you could have camera traps that are set up to look at changes in the biodiversity, particularly animals that are moving around. Um, there's, you know, LIDAR is increasingly used in terms of the forest structure itself. Are there changes in it? Uh, so there's, I mean, there's a huge bunch of stuff that can be done. Um, the question is how well they are implemented and how appropriate are they for a particular um, administrative setup? Great. And then we had a question from Min Sun Kim at the Korea National Park Service who points out that technology is important in conserving nature, but there are gaps and differences between developing countries and developed countries in the level of technologies. So how can we address this gap or this difference when it comes to using technology for nature conservation? Yeah, that's a super important uh, thing that really needs to be done. And uh, I would say the real fundamental thing that needs to be done there is building capacity in every country. So it's not just a top-down kind of thing that, okay, I have the technology, so I'm just going to go there and I'm going to implement this. It should be more in terms of, okay, I want to implement the technology, but let me also uh, build the uh, sort of the, 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 the training, the capacity in that particular place so that People there understand it. And my role is just to start things up. It's more of a catalyst rather than a, you know, the person who's just providing everything all the time. Um, and uh, which really usually doesn't work. So yeah, that's, that's how I would look at it. Great, thanks. And I think your presentation in a way also really tackled that, that issue uh, as well, you know, by looking at who initiates these sorts of projects, how do you build sustainability, et cetera. Okay, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there for, for now, Aditya, but if you can stay on the call a little bit longer, we will have a, another question and answer session, I hope, in a little sure, while. Um, and now I'd, I'd like to invite um, Mr. So, who's a program officer with the Korea National Park Service to uh, give a presentation from the Republic of Korea. And he'll be looking at an AI-based national park management system. So Korea has been doing some fantastic work in, uh, in using AI to help uh, manage their protected area system more effectively. And uh, so I look forward to learning more about the work that's been going on there. Uh, Mr. So, uh, over to you, please. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Okay, we can, we can see that and we can hear you fine. So please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Isok Su, and I'm working for the Korea National Park Service as a program officer. It is such an honor to talk about the AI-based national park management systems proceeding in Korea. 
The project I'm going to talk today is being proceeded in Soraksan National Park. So first of all, let me give a brief introduction of the place. Um, today's presentation is divided into four sections with the ideas of AI usage in the field, followed by overall briefings on the industry academic collaboration works, and we go through the details of the process. And at the last, achievement and further goals will be followed. In 1970, Korean government designated Soraksan as a national park. And 12 years later, this area was designated as UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. In 2005, this place was reassigned its IUCN protect Protected Area Management category from 5 to 2. And in 2014 and 21, Soraksan was listed and relisted to the IUCN Green List Protected and Conserved Areas. It becomes one of the most important protected areas, both nationally and internationally. Over 3 million people visit every year, but also 11% of total species and 15% of endangered species inhabits. Furthermore, 42 cultural landscape resources are located in Soraksa National Park. It means that we have to find proper ways for the sustainable coexistence. AI technology is in com com comprehensive use throughout the national parks. It is uh, playing a bigger role for park management as advanced ways. We detect the habitat of population of endangered wild animals and our recently developed system for detecting dead trees in suburb pine forest was an outstanding example of the successful AI monitoring models. But at the moment, we still have challenges and weakness in applying AI technology to the park management. We are currently in need of more ideas applying scientific systems using the drones. To use it more efficient ways, automated systems should be introduced. To respond toward the weakness, we collaborate the Industry Academic Cooperation Projects with Yonsei University, which is one of the most efficient and prolific college in Korea. Together, we can develop automated drone operation systems and build, build consortium to collect ideas of drone usage. We are aiming to build more comprehensive park governance over the national park throughout the country under the value of challenge, creativity, and sustainability. Also, a lot of researchers, professors, and other experts are helping this project with enthusiasm. We believe we can achieve carbon neutrality through the integral education on technology and environment. Through specialized program and platform, education system can get qualified lectures from expert, field-oriented learnings, and high-tech lab environment. To make it more successful ways, we allocate the rules that can utilize each institution's advantage. Yonsei University support like class curriculums, labs for drone designing, and recreation group operation. Korea National Park support like field excursions, expert invitation, and budget for the drone production. Engineering College gathered three departments, which is the Department of Computer Science, Electrical Engineering, and Mechanical Engineering. They used to give indi individual lectures based on AI, IoT, and mobility before, but in order to establish the joint education, this school has started new curriculums focusing on comprehensive technology and a platform which students can meet and work together. University facilitated a drone lab where the student can make and test their drones. The drones in 
The, the lab is equipped with high-tech machines, including 3D printers, and the student working for this project is free to use it at any time. Students form the after-class club so that they can work firmly and widely in and out of the campus. Soraksa National Park office support like inviting drone experts and manufacturer companies for the students so that they can keep track on the latest technology. We also open the environmental class to educate the conservation values of nature and purchase the part of drones so that students can design and make the drone fully. Moreover, the students are invited to the seminars and the field excursions, experiencing a variety of experiments in the fields. In their seminars, the people from each party share the results and discuss the difficulties. Soraksan office tried to help them to understand more about what the park management works like and lead them to experience the public service and equipment. The project has two main goals. One is to develop an automated drone monitoring system and the other securing ideas for drone usage in terms of park management. So far, eight innovation ideas were gathered and the four ideas were chosen for the further study. There are the drones for illegal activity detecting, COVID-19 social distancing, drone, drone photo service, and tracking wild animals. To achieve our final goals, the project is divided into three steps. The drones are developed and modified throughout each step. And after the final test, the successful one will be, the, will be placed in the field. In more details, first drone ideas are gathered and modeled by students in the lab. And second, the drones are tested indoors and checked that they aviate properly. Final step is the field test like considering weather conditions and drone durability. By present, step two has ended and few drones are under throw in the field assessment. To go more for uh, details and the drones we are working on, full support was applied it, and the experts support them to concentrate on their ideas. In the first stage, we had, we had eight new drones ideas and next three ideas had positive reviews. That is the drone for detecting illegal activities by visitors and the drone that can analyze the visitor's density to prevent COVID-19. Also, the idea of photo service drone was well reserved. In the second step, only the successful drone after demonstration season will go through an indoor test. We check up how well the body is controlled while flying and whether the software is working properly. These video clips shows the drones de detecting illegal activities. And those drones come to more accurate recognition and have been well accustomed to automate automated controlling systems. The system is designed to narrow down start where illegal actions occur and dispatch drones with when human activities are detected. These drones can give cautions or warnings. They are stationed in nearby place, collecting track information and send the result to the main controlling tower. And finally, the field test. In the final stage, drone which have passed indoor test will be demonstrated in the actual field. And to figure out the feasibility of drone's work, School facilities and experts are invited. Currently, a few drones have finished their, this final stage and started on-site on trail to check their dura durability and environmental changes. The, the project was suspend, suspended for a while due to COVID-19, but test was recently resumed. The detailed descriptions and the goals were shared in online expo. 
And a lot of universities and companies were highly impressed. And one of the students already on the patent on his animal monitoring system. And overall, the project has started pro producing meaningful results. We designed five key ideas for this project in the future. We are planning to supply various courses and hire bigger facil facilities and experts with more budget. Also, the student can experience frequent field excursions and brand new equipment in the lab. And eventually, after comprehensive tests in the lab and fields, the drone will be performed in all our national park. To sum up, we are able to achieve three key outcomes toward this project. Though, though automated system, we can overcome manpower limits and new ideas of drone usage can expand the scope of our park management. Cooperative chain models gives us the confidence and the power that we can go together for the better picture. Korean National Park Service is in its continuous effort to understand the AI technology with different views and put it in the center of our future park management systems because we believe that this technology will help our environment to be sustainable. And finally, we look very forward to having you here in Korea and showing you around our project to better future soon. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, you, uh, you can uh, message us and we, we are going to share. Thank you very much, Mr. So. That was really fascinating to hear about the, the work that's being done by, by KMPS. And uh, I thought it was um, you know, particularly powerful the way you framed your presentation. You started off with a, a problem, which was the shortage of trained drone operators and you put into place uh, a dedicated program to, to address that uh, in a very creative way. Uh, and that has not only led to more drone operators, but to new and uh, innovative ways to use drones as, as well. Uh, I also like the way in which you are developing partnerships with the academic sector and, uh, and universities. So thank you for sharing that. And I personally would love to come and spend time in your drone laboratory. That sounds, uh, that sounds wonderful. So we are, we're bang on time and we do have uh, some time available for, for questions. Um, I, if I could use my uh, position as facilitator to ask one question to Mr. So, you mentioned that one of the new drone technologies had received a patent. Uh, the one for wildlife tracking. And I was just wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, what exactly did it, does it do and, and how does it work? Uh, okay, uh, before we use the um, animal tracking AI system for only for the monitoring. So we cannot, um, we cannot track the animal the way they go. Uh, but using the drone, we can track the way they go. Like uh, we can find the habitat and the way they, the, the road they go. So we can find more like more things that animals behave in the national park. So I think it is another di different, di di different before because before we just monitored in a one spot, but we can uh, use it all around the National Park through the drones. Great, thank you. Okay, there's a couple of questions in the chat, which maybe uh, Aditya would be best place to, to answer. Uh, one is, um, is there a database for endangered species where uh, AI uh, can be used um, to uh, basically help uh, identify the, um, the, the individuals. Um, so for example, cheetahs have unique patches. Um, so I, I know that Adita, you've worked on something similar for elephants. So you, maybe you could answer that. Uh, and there was also a question where concern has been expressed about the Asiatic lions in India, which are coming closer to villages. 
And is there any way in which these can be tracked without radio coloring them? So I think Mr. So was already referring to some techniques there, um, but again, maybe Aditya, over to you. Aditya, are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just typing a response. Um, maybe that's uh, that'll be clearer than talking. Okay, um, okay. Well, we'll wait for your response in the in the chat then. Um, so there's another question which is asking uh, Korea National Park Service. Um, thank you for the presentation. Could you explain a bit more about how you're using AI to monitor illegal activities in the national park? Are you tracking visitors or are the drones on some kind of patrol route? Oh yes, we can, we can answer the question. Um, illegal activities is a big problem, big problem in national park because of the, uh, when the people uh, go to illegal place, it is so dangerous for them to come down, go out of the park. So, uh, in Soraksan, we know the spot that illegal actions happens. So we uh, we are going to uh, make some systems, and we will put um, small drone station. And when we when the sensor um, sends the people who go the illegal spot, drone will go up, and then he will track the illegal uh, track the person, and they will they are going to warning they, they're going to warn the people who are doing that behaviors and yeah our all system is going to be automate automated so we are developing the system through the academic uh, through the uh, industry academic systems yes okay thanks for that and that's led to a follow-on question uh, what types of illegal activities do you have in national parks in Korea? Mm -hmm. uh, we, in national, uh, we in Korea, um, so many people go to the place where uh, uh, where uh, we don't uh, we don't allow to go. Like um, there is a lot of loot, but Korea in Korea national park is so big, and when they go to the another place, it is so dangerous that. They can be, uh, uh, it is so dangerous. So most of the illegal things is like they go to the another place that we, that we don't want, that, that we don't uh, let them go, uh, uh, official, not official trails. Most of the illegal things are the, are the not official trails, yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. I think uh, now we should maybe move on uh, to our case study from, from China. And uh, I'm very pleased to welcome back uh, Professor Li from the Chinese Academy of Forestry, who has been very passionate about the use of technology for uh, many years and has been pioneering the use of technology in China's protected area system. And he'll be giving a presentation on establishing a biodiversity monitoring system for protected areas in China. Uh, so, Professor Li, uh, over to you, please. Uh, uh, give a briefly introduction to uh, uh, biodiversity monitoring information system in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the okay. my topic is uh, ne next slide, please. Uh, about uh, uh, the four aspects. The first one is the massive of biodiversity monitoring of the protected area in China, and then there will be the introduction of the framework of the uh, biodiversity monitoring system. The three uh, 
Now, uh, I will briefly talk about the key equipment, uh, the technologies for the biodiversity monitoring. And uh, uh, the floor is talk about uh, little, uh, the design of the platform. Now, um, after more than six years of development, more than uh, 20,000 protected areas were established in China. It covers 80% of the land and 40.6% of the ocean. It has become the core part of the ecological security and biodiversity conservation. As a, um, the protected area management must based on understanding of the basic information of the key conservation uh, goals. Next, please. And, uh, need, need to know uh, what, is, um, can, what is the uh, um, species. Uh, and the uh, ecosystem in the protected area, and uh, where are they uh, located, and uh, what is their uh, uh, change? So we need to establish the uh, scientific uh, uh, standard uh, method, method to obtain the those data, and establish the uh, data management uh, system. This data being interpreted and the shared and also uh, uh, then can get the uh, protected area protection action so, uh, so, in China um, there are many problems with, uh, uh, in China and uh, uh, such as the um, some protected areas have good um, data on biodiversity, but uh, just the few, the lack of uh, system monitor biodiversity monitoring uh, criteria and uh, uh, couldn't uh, exchange the data uh, in the national level. So there is an isolated island of information. At the same time, the lack of um, monitoring equipment and the personal capacity. Therefore, we need to establish the unified platform, the unified criteria to develop a Chinese, Chinese protected area monitoring system. Next, please. In the uh, next, the second uh, part is a uh, introduction of the uh, framework. Next. As a, according to the uh, but what's the monitoring uh, requirement of the government? We, we try to we try to uh, establish the uh, auto uh, transmission uh, but what's the information system? So the overall objective of the system is using the increasing nature new network, network uh, translation data acquisition and the story knowledge included the uh, various uh, ad hoc network code cloud the computing and the bigger data and so on so the, try to establish the uh, system which can see the wildlife and the human and can control human disturbance uh, uh, system to uh, uh, for the uh, protected area management. Second, uh, ne next. 
automatically can summation in threaded camera for wildlife monitoring and AI uh, technology used for auto photo and video identification. But secondly, we uh, try to uh, do some research about the folder for a creation system for board, frog, and the bed, and the canine keeper, and the AI identification. And then you try to uh, utilize the GPS color for wildlife moment uh, uh, studies. And the UAV for wildlife monitor and the protected area touch. Mm. And when is the whole network uh, system for 4G free communication areas? And the remote sensing of the analysis and the human impacted, uh, impacted assessment. This is a uh, uh, seven aspects uh, in our uh, research for the biodiversity uh, monitoring system. Uh, the last uh, one is a try to uh, establish a, a new uh, biodiversity monitoring um, platform try to establish a comprehensive biodiversity database including the best information database of project area, important habitat, original habitat protection points, biodiversity monitoring database, and the national land use change supervision and the inspection database of project area. And the development related application system provided the Staff with uh, data collection, decision support, and all the information management uh, tools. So pro provided the information release and the service channel for public. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, uh, here is uh, uh, some example for the. Uh, uh, in the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, platform. The first one is the overview of, of the national uh, nature reserve. Uh, it is easy to display the replacement application and the uh, uh, data, uh, summary of the data, and such as the park um, and the uh, average. Month of the data collection. The second, uh, well, you, you can next step is, is about we can uh, next step, please. Oh, this is the uh, can analysis and the display of the system. It is can show show display the uh, location of each. Uh, Recorded the uh, date and uh, try to do some analysis of uh, the species. Uh, next, and uh, try, uh, can conduct the cultural statistic uh, analysis, such as uh, uh, the, uh, the species they are recorded and the human disturbance of. Uh, uh, the protected uh, area in the protected, and also uh, for can show the uh, work uh, for, for, for finish that work. And also, the next, uh, this is the uh, Shenongjia National Park. Also, can in the can in anything in the uh, protected area. Uh, they will, uh, can display the on, on time or real time uh, working scenarios and also can show the uh, uh, data collection. The uh, next, please. No, uh, the next one is uh, showing the common attraction date and uh, can. What kind of data 
is uh, on uh, the uh, real-time uh, display and some historical uh, camera cropping data. Uh, this is uh, uh, my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Li, and uh, thank you to our China office for coming up with uh, an innovative solution to our, our technical problem. So I think it's a, a good demonstration that technology is, is not always uh, in, infallible, um, but it can certainly provide us with very, very useful information. And China has definitely put in place an incredible, an, an incredible system for gathering data from across its protected area system. And it's clear that it's just getting stronger and stronger all the time and uh, more and more integrated with many different layers of information and many different kinds of information uh, being added to that. So thank you for, for sharing, sharing that with us. So we'll move on to the case study from Thailand while we uh, wait to see if Professor Lee can join us. Um, Ms. Chaturun is a forestry tech technical officer with the Smart Patrol Monitoring Center with the Department of National Parks, Wildlife and Plant Conservation. Thailand has a very uh, advanced system uh, of using smart patrolling and uh, we'll be hearing uh, about that from, uh, from Ms. Chaturun. Um, Ms. Chaturun will be presenting in Thai, uh, but my colleague Vivi we'll do sequential translation. So we'll have a, a pause after uh, each slide and uh, Vivi will translate from Thai uh, into, into English. So uh, please uh, bear with us. We know that that will take a little bit of uh, extra time, but we thought this was uh, an important presentation that you would be interested in hearing. So uh, Kun Chatarun, over, over to you, please. <laughs> Uh, and we can see your slides, but please, please put them on uh, full presentation mode. Okay. Okay. เสียงไมค์ก่อนมั้ยคะว่าไมค์เวิร์คหรือเปล่าได้ยินมั้ยคะได้ยินค่ะได้ยินโอเคค่ะกดแชร์สไลด์ตรงปุ่มขวาด้
ล่าสัตว์การทําไม้นะคะการบุกรุกแพ่วถางหรือแม้แต่การเก็บหาของป่านะคะที่เป็นข้อมูลของประเทศไทยก็จะเจอข้อมูลและภาพต่างๆเหล่านี้นะคะที่ที่ทุกคนให้ความสนใจค่ะ So if you search the internet, Google the internet with the keyword Thailand um, approaching uh, encroachment, illegal logging, or wildlife collection, you will see a lot of images. Uh, ซึ่งงานต่างๆเหล่านี้นะคะล้วนเกี่ยวข้องกับกรมอุทยานแห่งชาติสัตว์ป่าและพันธุ์พืชหรือว่าเรียกสั้นๆว่า DNP นะคะ So all these activities are related to under the responsibility of the Department of Wild National Park Wildlife and Plant Conservation or acronym DNP. ทางกรมอุทยานนะคะได้นำเครื่องมืออันหนึ่งนะคะซึ่งมีชื่อว่า Smart p a t o นะคะเพื่อเข้ามาแก้ไขปัญหาเหล่านี้ค่ะ So the DNP DNP introduced and applied the tools called Smart p a t o For ranger to address this issue. ซึ่งระบบ Smart Pato เนี่ยนำเข้ามาใช้ในประเทศไทย10กว่าปีแล้วนะคะแต่ว่า DNP เนี่ยนำมาใช้อย่างเข้มข้นเมื่อ3ปีที่ผ่านมาค่ะ Actually, the Smart Pato system was introduced to Thailand over 10 years ago, but DNP only adopted and implemented in the past three years. ค่ะซึ่งอย่างไรในความเป็นจริงแล้วเนี่ยนะคะพาโทดัตเตอร์เบสเนี่ยในประเทศไทยนะคะมีการนำเข้ามาใช้ได้เกือบ20ปีแล้วนะคะโดยเริ่มจากในปี2005นะคะถึง2006เนี่ยใช้ถังข้อมูลที่เรียกว่าไมค์ค่ะ Actually for the Pato database in Thailand, the system has been uh, established almost 20 years ago. Uh, the first system was through the My Program in two, between 2005 and 2006. ค่ะแล้วต่อมาในปี2006ถึง2013นะคะเราใช้ฐานข้อมูลที่เรียกว่า MIS ค่ะ Later, the following year, 2006 to 2013, they used the MIS um, database. และตั้งแต่ปี2013ถึงปัจจุบันนะคะเราใช้ระบบที่เรียกว่า Smart ค่ะ And from 2013 onward they are DNP using the Smart System ค่ะซึ่งทั้ง3ระบบนี้นะคะโดยในช่วงเริ่มต้นเนี่ยก็จะนำมาใช้ในพื้นที่ต้นแบบทางกลุ่มป่าตะวันตกหรือเว็บคอมนะคะ So um, the three uh, system database have been used in the Western Forest Complex or in acronym WebCom in the pilot site. ค่ะส่วนฐานข้อมูล Smart นะคะก็นำเริ่มต้นใช้เนี่ยเป็น10กว่าปีแล้วแต่ว่าในช่วงที่ใช้อย่างเข้มข้นที่ทาง DNP ได้มีนโยบายให้ใช้อย่างเข้มข้นก็คือในช่วง3ปีหลังนะคะตั้งแต่ปี2000 19เป็นต้นมาค่ะ So uh, the smart uh, database have been uh, used intensively under the policy of DNP from 2019 onward ค่ะโดยรูปแบบขั้นตอนระบบ smart pato ที่ใช้ในประเทศไทยนะคะก็จะเป็นดังภาพที่ขึ้นมาให้เห็นนะคะเป็น4ขั้นตอนหลักๆค่ะ So the The process of the smart uh, system is uh, identified using the four uh, steps as seen in the graphic here. ค่ะเริ่มต้นจากที่เจ้าหน้าที่ลาตะเวนนะคะลงพื้นที่แล้วก็ทําการลาตะเวนแล้วก็เก็บข้อมูลโดยใช้ smart data form ค่ะค่ะ It start with the ranger do the patrolling on site and provide data input using the smart form. ค่ะจากนั้นข้อมูลจะถูกส่งต่อให้กับเจ้าหน้าที่ดูแลฐานข้อมูลสมาร์ทนะคะเพื่อนําข้อมูลมาลงในฐานข้อมูลค่ะ And then the data information will be submit to the the operation officer who will provide an input and mapping in in the database ค่ะข้อมูลต่างๆเหล่านี้นะคะจะนํามาถูกวิเคราะห์แล้วก็ทําออกมาให้เห็นเป็นข้อมูลในรูปแบบต่างๆยกตัวอย่างเช่นเป็นแผนที่หรือว่ารายงานต่างๆค่ะ And the data will be analyzed and be used uh, for the analysis uh, in the different form, for example, like as a map or as a report. 
for decision making ค่ะข้อมูลที่ถูกวิเคราะห์แล้วนะคะจะนำมาใช้ในเรื่องของการพาโทรแพลนนิ่งนะคะโดยส่วนมากจะอยู่ในรูปแบบของการประชุมในระดับพื้นที่ป่าอนุรักษ์ค่ะ So uh, the analyzed uh, data will be used to plan the the, the next uh, pato uh, survey on site. ค่ะปัจจุบันกรมอุทยานนะคะใช้ระบบ smart pato ทั่วประเทศนะคะครอบคลุมพื้นที่19กลุ่มป่าแล้วก็รวมทั้งหมด213แห่งนะคะของพื้นที่อนุรักษ์ค่ะ So right now, the Department of the National Park um, applied the smart patrolling in all their protected area, over more than 200 protected area, under the 19 uh, forest complex. ค่ะสำหรับสไลด์นี้นะคะเป็นไฮไลท์ของสรุปผลการทำงานของ DNP ในช่วงตั้งแต่ปี2018ถึง2020นะคะ So this slide uh, show the highlight of the the pato monitoring from 2018-2020. ค่ะภาพภาพบนทางด้านซ้ายนะคะแสดงถึงระยะทางการลาดตะเวนนะคะส่วนภาพบนขวาแสดงถึงเปอร์เซ็นต์ของ pato coverage ค่ะ The 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 first two top uh, the left one is uh, display the pato distance and the left on top is uh, to the, the display the pato coverage. ค่ะส่วนภาพทางด้านล่างนะคะแสดงถึงจำนวนที่พบปัจจัยคุกคามนะคะต่อระยะทางลาดตะเวน 1,000 กิโลเมตรค่ะ and the, the, the graph in the bottom the show the, the threat uh, different type of threat uh, per uh, the distance survey ค่ะโดยปัจจัยคุกคามนะคะที่นำมานำเสนอนะคะในวันนี้ก็จะมีในเรื่องของอการล่านะคะในเรื่องของการเก็บหาของป่าการทำไม้แล้วก็การบุกรุกแพ่วถางรวมถึงผลรวมของปัจจัยคุกคามทั้งหมดค่ะ So the 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 threat that they are used to analyze is on the poaching uh, uh, non forest uh, harvest and uh, logging and enforcement ค่ะโดยสมมติฐานเนี่ยนะคะในการทำงานลาดตะเวนนะคะเมื่อมีระยะทางลาดตะเวนที่เพิ่มขึ้นนะคะเปอร์เซ็นต์พาโทเข้าวเรทก็จะเพิ่มขึ้นนะคะรวมถึงเมื่อมีการเดินลาดตะเวนได้ครอบคลุมพื้นที่มากขึ้นเนี่ยสมมุติฐานเบื้องต้นก็คือเราจะเจอปัจจัยคุกคามมากขึ้นค่ะ So uh, the the work is based on the assumption that the the longer patrolling distance you make the the higher the patrol coverage and also the higher threat to be found ค่ะแต่มีจุดที่น่าสนใจนะคะในกราฟนะคะก็คือว่าในปี2020นะคะระยะทางลาดตะเวนนะคะแล้วก็เปอร์เซ็นต์พาโทเข้าวเรทเนี่ยเพิ่มขึ้นนะคะแต่ในเรื่องของจำนวนปัจจัยคุกคามต่อระยะทาง 1,000 กิโลเนี่ยกลับลดลงค่ะ However from the data analyzed in the, the graph on the bottom it have shown uh, interesting um, point is that like um, the The threat per 1,000 km have decreased in 2020, even though the pato distance and pato coverage is increased. ค่ะอาจกล่าวได้ว่านะคะสิ่งนี้แสดงถึงการทำงานหนักของเจ้าหน้าที่ลาดตะเวนในประเทศไทยค่ะ This could uh, re, uh, demonstrate the hard work of the patrolling uh, and the pato of the ranger in Thailand. ค่ะซึ่งหมายความว่าเมื่อมีการเดินลาดตะเวนแล้วนะคะก็คือการควบคุมพื้นที่นะคะการบังคับใช้กฎหมายรวมถึงการป้องกันที่จะให้เกิดการกระทําผิดนะคะถือว่ามีความประสบประสบความสําเร็จมากขึ้นนะคะในปี2020 So it also show that in 2020 all the work uh, in the protection and survey is have uh, help with the enforcement and also reduce the 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 threat and the incident uh, happen
ค่ะนอกจากนี้นะคะข้อมูลจากฐานข้อมูลสมาร์ทนะคะทางกรมอุทยานนะคะร่วมกับมหาวิทยาลัยเกษตรศาสตร์แล้วก็ WCS Thailand นะคะได้นำข้อมูลมาใช้ในการวิเคราะห์เพื่อประโยชน์ในการจัดการพื้นที่ค่ะ So the data that got from the Smart Plateau, the Department of National Park, เกษตรศาสตร์ University WCS also used to, to to analyze how to manage uh, the area. ค่ะตัวอย่างแรกนะคะเป็นข้อมูลของอุทยานแห่งชาติทับลานนะคะซึ่งอยู่ในพื้นที่มรดกโลกทางธรรมชาติป่าพนุป่าดงพญาเย็นเขาใหญ่ค่ะ Uh, the first case that she would like to share is uh, the analysis from Thailand National Park, which is part of the Khao Yai Dong p h a y e n World Heritage Site. ค่ะในภาพนะคะเป็นการวิเคราะห์ gap analysis ดูในเรื่องของการปัญหาเรื่องการทำไม้นะคะ So in the the, the picture show is show gap analysis of the problem on logging. ค่ะซึ่งจะนําข้อมูล2ส,ส่วนก็คือในเรื่องของการพบการทําไม้ในพื้นที่แล้วก็ความถี่ในเรื่องของการลาตะเวนนะคะมาดูเพื่อให้ดูว่ากลิ่นไหนพื้นที่ไหนที่ควรจะเพิ่มหรือว่าพื้นที่ไหนควรจะลดความถี่ในการลาตะเวนให้เหมาะสมค่ะ So the image show the the hotspot of like the the case that happening that they found um illegal logging activity And also the frequency of the patrolling survey, so that they can plan to to have um, uh, area and appearance accordingly. All right, ha. Uh, it's hard, little. Yeah, it's stuck. She said. <laughs> ค่ะอีกตัวอย่างหนึ่งนะคะเป็นข้อมูลจากกลุ่มป่าตะวันตกหรือเว็บคอมนะคะดูในเรื่องของพื้นที่อาศัยของช้างนะคะ uh, The second case is from the Western Forest Complex to study the the habitat of the wild, wild elephant ค่ะซึ่งตัวการวิผลการวิเคราะห์ข้อมูลนี้นะคะมีประโยชน์ในเรื่องของการหา Natural Corridor นะคะเพื่อดูในเรื่องการกระจายของช้างป่าบริเวณพื้นที่เชื่อมต่อของป่านุรักษ์ค่ะ So the result of this analysis is have have help on the do the habitat understanding about the elephant distribution so that they can have the conservation plan on the corridor of the forest forest corridor ค่ะข้อมูลเอ่อ smart database นะคะที่จำนวนมากเหล่านี้นะคะทางกรมอุทยานนะคะก็ได้จัดทำ DNP Smart Database ขึ้นมารองรับข้อมูลค่ะ uh, DNP have uh, exhibit uh, the database on 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 online to to, to contain all this uh, amount of data ค่ะ uh, ตัวนี้เป็นระบบออนไลน์เพื่อที่จะจัดส่งแล้วก็จัดเก็บข้อมูล Smart นะคะโดยมี uh, user ที่ใช้อยู่ตอนนี้อย่างน้อยนะคะจากพื้นที่นรัก213แห่งทั่วประเทศค่ะ So this database is being used by 213 protected area, and it's an online system for submitting the data and uh, retrieve the data. ค่ะ Smart database ตัวนี้ใช้อย่างจริงจังมา2ปีนะคะตอนนี้มีข้อมูลอยู่ประมาณ 5,000 กว่าชุดนะคะ So they have over 5,000 entry, and this uh, database online database uh, system is uh, online for two years. ในส่วนของข้อมูลสมาร์ทนะคะที่เป็นก้อนข้อมูลของแต่ละพื้นที่นะคะอตอนนี้ก็มีอย่างน้อยข้อมูล213ก้อนนะคะ so data set they have 213 data set ค่ะซึ่งในแต่ละพื้นที่เนี่ยเขาจะมีก้อนข้อมูลตัวนี้ของของพื้นที่ของเขาเองนะคะแล้วก็ทั้งหมด213ก้อนก็จะนำมารวบรวมไว้ที่ศูนย์สมาร์ทของกรมอุทยานนะคะ
So um, each station have their own set of data which is shared to the Department of National Park. ค่ะที่สูงสมาร์ทกรมจะมีหน้าที่ในการรวบรวมแล้วก็อัปเดตข้อมูลนะคะทุกเดือนนะคะโดยดึงข้อมูลจากตัวระบบออนไลน์มาอัปเดตทุกเดือนค่ะ So um, in her unit uh, she have like every month she have to retrieve this data, uh, data set from its site and upload to the central system like a, as administrator อีกอีกเรื่องที่ทางกรมอุทยานให้ความสำคัญคือในเรื่องของการเทรนนิ่งในเรื่อง smart patho ค่ะ Uh, another issue that the Department of National Park keep a lot of emphasis is on the smart patrolling training. ค่ะเรามีอยู่2หลักสูตรนะคะก็1เป็นหลักสูตรของเจ้าหน้าที่รัตเวนนะคะแล้วก็2เป็นหลักสูตรของเจ้าหน้าที่ฐานข้อมูลสมาร์ทค่ะ So there are two uh, training. Uh, one is for the ranger and another one is for the the database management. ค่ะปัจจุบันทางกรมอุทยานนะคะมีวิทยากรแล้วก็มีครูฝึกนะคะซึ่งกรมอุทยานาสร้างเทรนเนอร์ชุดนี้ขึ้นมาเพื่อให้เป็นวิทยากรในด้านของสมาร์ทพาโทโดยเฉพาะค่ะ uh, DNP have conduct a lot of training of the trainer so that the DNP staff will become the trainer for the smart p a t o l ค่ะนอกจากนั้นจะมีในเรื่องของความร่วมมือจากองค์กรภายนอกนะคะเข้ามาช่วยในงานสมาร์ทพาโทของกรมอุทยานค่ะ They also receive uh, external support from the other organization like in the picture to support the smart p a t o l system development ค่ะโดยในเดือนมีนาคม2020นะคะมีการลงนามบันทึกข้อตกลงมีการลงนาม MOU นะคะเพื่อการพัฒนาระบบลาตะเวนเชิงคุณภาพค่ะ So in uh, March last year, uh, they signed a memorandum of understanding to develop the uh, smart p a t o l system. ค่ะโดย MOU นี้นะคะมีสี่หน่วยงานที่ร่วมลงนามนะคะก็จะมีอ่ามหาวิทยาลัยเกษตรศาสตร์หรือ KU นะคะมี DNP มี WCS Thailand แล้วก็ WWF Thailand ค่ะ The the four party that sign this MOU and as you can see in the logo uh, from the Sai Sai Unity DMP WCSF at WWF Thailand. ค่ะในส่วนของศูนย์กลางในการทำหน้าที่พัฒนาระบบ Smart p a t o l นะคะก็คือ Smart p a t o l Monitoring Center ที่ส่วนกลางที่กรมอุทยานนะคะ Um, so this is a the DNP Smart p a t o l Monitoring Center are located at DNP headquarters in Bangkok. ค่ะซึ่งออฟฟิศของศูนย์สมาร์ทพาโทที่กรมนะคะในปลายปี2018เนี่ยก็เป็นออฟฟิศเล็กๆนะคะมีมีแค่2ส่วนก็คือมีห้องทำงานแล้วก็มีห้องประชุมค่ะทางด้านซ้ายมือนะคะค่ะ so you can see the two years ago the office is very small only like a small uh, small work office space and a small meeting room ค่ะแล้วหลังจากนั้นเมื่อมีการขยายงานสมาร์ทปาโทแล้วก็เพิ่มความเข้มข้นในการทํางานนะคะก็ในปลายปี2020นะคะก็มีการเปิดศูนย์สมาร์ทแห่งใหม่นะคะก็ใหญ่ขึ้นกว่าเดิมนะคะก็จะมี4ส่วนก็คือมีห้องทํางานมีห้องประชุมมีห้องเทรนนิ่งแล้วก็มีโซนนิทรรศการค่ะภาพทางขวามือค่ะค่ะ so if you see on the right hand side that is have been expand due to more intensity of the work and more partnership So in the December 2020, they have expanded the, uh, the center that have like workspace, have training room, have bigger meeting room, and also exhibition area. ค่ะซึ่งการจัดตั้งศูนย์สมาร์ทพาโทนะคะก็มีหน่วยงานองค์กรหลายๆหน่วยงานจากภายนอกเข้ามามีส่วนร่วมก็ตามที่เห็นในโลโก้ด้านล่างนะคะ You can see the external collaboration according to the logo uh, listed below. ค่ะในศูนย์สมาร์ทแห่งใหม่นี้นะคะก็ได้รับเกียรติจากรัฐมนตรีว่าการกระทรวงทรัพยากรและสิ่งแวดล้อมนะคะมาเปิดศูนย์สมาร์ทแห่งใหม่นะคะซึ่งแสดงให้เห็นถึงความสนใจแล้วก็การให้ความสำคัญของผู้บริหารนะคะ And this uh, new uh, center have been uh, a, a, in uh, in uh, opened by the Minister of Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment which show the strong political support for for this type of work บทบาทหน้าที่ของศูนย์สมาร์ทพาโทนะคะก็ตามที่โชว์ในสไลด์นะคะซึ่งสรุปได้ว่าศูนย์สมาร์ทพาโทเนี่ยก็คือมี
บทบาทหน้าที่ในการที่จะสนับสนุนผลักดันงานทุกอย่างที่เกี่ยวข้องกับการพัฒนาระบบสมาร์ทปาโทในประเทศไทยค่ะ So uh, you can read on the screen about the role and responsibility of the smart patrolling monitoring sector. Uh, in summary, that they have the role to support and you know to implement uh, the the smart patrolling system in Thailand. ค่ะสำหรับเป้าหมายของกรมอุทยานนะคะในอนาคตในเรื่องของ smart patrol นะคะก็อันดับแรกก็เป็นในเรื่องของการเพิ่มจำนวนเจ้าหน้าที่ที่เป็นที่ทำงานแบบลาดตะเวนแบบฟูลไทม์ค่ะ So one of the vision that they want to have in the future for the smart p a t r o l is to have more full time staff patrolling staff ค่ะเนื่องจากว่าในพื้นที่อุทยานแห่งชาติในประเทศไทยนะคะโดยส่วนใหญ่เนี่ยเจ้าหน้าที่ก็จะทำงานในเรื่องของงานบริการนักท่องเที่ยวมากกว่านะคะเพราะฉะนั้นตอนหลังเรามีความพยายามที่จะให้เจ้าหน้าที่เหล่านั้นนะคะทำงานลาดตะเวนให้มากขึ้นค่ะ Because uh, normally the the staff at the national park they're doing a lot of work to be uh, to do with the the tourism tourists uh, and they want to see more staff uh, more engaged in the p a t r o l i n g ค่ะเป้าหมายต่อไปของกรมอุทยานนะคะเป้าหมายลำดับต่อมาก็คือในเรื่องของเปอร์เซ็นต์พาโทเคาวเรตนะคะในแต่ละปีก็จะต้องไม่น้อยกว่า 70% ของพื้นที่นุรักษ์เป้าหมายค่ะ They also have set the target to do the patrolling to be not less than 70% for every p o c k e t area ค่ะเป้าหมายต่อไปก็คือพื้นที่นุรักษ์ทุกแห่งรวมถึงผู้บริหารทุกระดับนะคะควรจะต้องนำข้อมูลจาก Smart d a t a b a s มาใช้วางแผนทำงานอย่างจริงจังค่ะ And this is also recommended. All the database, uh, all the data analyzed from the smart patrol should be used by the 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 head of the unit and the policy maker. ค่ะและลำดับสุดท้ายก็คือในเรื่องของการเทรนนิ่งนะคะจะต้องมีอย่างสม่ำเสมอและต่อเนื่องค่ะ And it's very really important to have a regular training and uh, con con regular and continuous uh, training. และการทำงานในระบบสมาร์ทปาโทจะต้องได้รับการสนับสนุนนะคะทั้งในเรื่องของเครื่องมืออุปกรณ์รวมถึงเทคโนโลยีต่างๆที่เกี่ยวข้องค่ะ And to to have this more effective the, the equipment and the technology should be uh, up to date and suitable for for this type of work ค่ะสำหรับสมาร์ทปาโทในประเทศไทยก็มีเพียงเท่านี้ค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ This is a presentation from Thailand Thank you very much That's great. Thank you very much, Kun Chatarun. And uh, I think uh, Thailand has put in place a, a really impressive system, and it's uh, obviously generating huge amounts of, of data, a real wealth of information. And uh, as you showed in your in your slides, it already seems to be leading to uh, improved management effectiveness, uh, which is of course what we're trying to achieve at the at the end of the day. So thank you very much for for sharing the experience from Thailand, and thank you as well to Kun Bibi for for doing the translation. I think uh, I had a question for Kun uh, Chaturun, uh, maybe Bibi, if you're able to to translate. Um, I um, I was just wondering, um, what is the most uh, common threat that is identified during the smart patrols? And can they give us an example of where they have uh, changed their management practices in order to respond to the threats? มีคำถามให้คุณฉัตรอรุณนะคะว่าระหว่างที่เกิดการลาตะเวนสมาร์ทเนี่ยค่ะไม่ทราบว่าเทรดคุกคามที่ที่ที่พบเยอะที่สุดเนี่ยค่ะเป็นเป็นอะไรแล้วก็ทางฝ่ายบริหารได้ทำการปรับรูปแบบในการจัดการประเด็นพวกนั้นอย่างไรบ้างอะคะ่ะคุณชัดวรุณยังอยู่ไหมคะฮัลโหลได้ยินไหมคะได้ยินแล้วค่ะโอเคค่ะอ่าปัจจัยคุกคามเนี่ยจะแตกต่างกันนะคะในแต่ละกลุ่มป่าในแต่ละพื้นที่นะคะแต่โดยภาพรวมแล้วเนี่ยในประเทศไทยส่วนใหญ่จะเป็นในเรื่องของอการล่านะคะการล่าสัตว์
จะค่อนข้างสูงนะคะแล้วก็ทางกรมได้จัดการยังไงใช่ไหมคะก็ความพยายามอันดับแรกเลยก็คือในเรื่องของการพยายามหาเครื่องมือหาเทคโนโลยีเข้ามาใช้จัดการปัญหาก็คือสมาร์ทพาโทนี่ก็คือเครื่องมือหนึ่งนะคะที่ดึงเข้ามาใช้เพื่อจัดการปัญหาในเรื่องปัจจัยคุกคามนะคะส่วนวิธีการจัดการปัญหาเนี่ยถ้าในในนโยบายของกลมเนี่ยก็ก็จะมีในเรื่องของการสนับสนุนนะคะในเรื่องของเจ้าหน้าที่รัตเวนที่จะสนับสนุนในเรื่องการเดินรัตเวนทั้งในเรื่องของอุปกรณ์เรื่องของวิธีการเทคนิคต่างๆในการเข้าทำงานนะคะอย่างการอบรมการเทรนนิ่งเนี่ยเราก็สอนในเรื่องของเทคนิคการทำงานเน้นในเรื่องเทคนิคการทำงานในการวางแผนรัตเวนในการเข้าจับกลุ่มในการป้องกันตัวนะคะแล้วก็ท่านที่บดีเนี่ยก็ค่อนข้างย้ำนะคะว่าให้ให้คำนึงถึงความปลอดภัยของของเจ้าหน้าที่รัตเวนเป็นอันดับแรกอะคะ่ะขอบคุณค่ะ Um, so he said, uh, she said, like it depends on the forest complex. Some forests have di di different, but the major majority are wildlife watching. So how they address is is uh, on using the smart tattoo as a tools, and um, they also like uh, for the area that needed more the uh, patrolling, they, they will provide more staff and also provide them with uh, equipment. Uh, technicality and also provide training and those training particularly support uh, technology and the planning and also it's very important that the the ranger know how to uh, take care of themselves like you know safety first that the director general they really think this is very important so the ranger uh, normally got the training to do the the, the patrolling how they can make the arrest How they can defend themselves and how to to use the tools. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, let me just go back to Professor uh, Lee. I can see he's online, but I think he may be having technical problems with his his microphone. Uh, Professor Lee, are you able to to hear us? Are you able to to present? I'm sorry, we're not we're not able to to hear you. Okay, I'm sorry about this. We seem to be having some some technical difficulties uh, with uh, with Professor Lee. Um, so we'll just give it um, one more minute, and then. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to uh, end the uh, just end the webinar early. Um, if anyone has any other questions for participants, uh, please do go ahead and put those in the in the chat. Um, I had a question for Aditya, which was um, I was just wondering if you had had a chance to follow up with the uh, case uh, study that you presented from uh, from Bhutan. Um, and whether you know the the pilot system that had been installed there was still functioning after after all this time, and uh, whether the villagers had any any feedback on the system. I know there were a few teething problems initially with uh, the uh, sensors being too sensitive and the alarms going off uh, too too easily. Um, And uh, I was just wondering how how the system's doing now. If you've had a chance to go back, or if you've heard anything, thanks. Yeah, uh, I'm not very sure actually what is happening right now, uh, but I think there were uh, one of the issues is the rains because uh, it rains very heavily in those areas, uh, and when it does, there's things often you know go bad. There'll have to be some kind of parts that are replaced, that kind of thing. And uh, after the first season of that happened, uh, we came up on the COVID uh, pandemic. So I think it was just around, uh, you know, February or uh, March of last year when those parts were needed again, and then everything got shut down. And then uh, I don't, I'm not sure if they were sent 
but uh, there may have been issues there. So it just kind of illustrates, you know, the problems of um, when you have to ship these in from uh, quite far away, uh, there, there's a lot of challenges in that. Yeah, thank you, Aditya. Yeah, I think that is always a problem when we're dealing with, uh, with new technologies. And as you said, they can be uh, installed as part of a short-term project, but um, if there isn't a long-term maintenance plan in place, then uh, you may end up with, uh, what did you call it? Uh, <laughs> a heap of scrap junk or something. At the end of the day. Shiny pile of junk or yes, something like that. Exactly. Yeah. I think as we're now uh, over time, and I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, we'll end the, the webinar today. And I would just invite uh, Mr. Ko to give some very brief uh, closing remarks. Uh, Ko, over to you. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. I hope that you found today's webinar interesting and informative and that it will inspire you to make greater use of digital technology to conserve nature in your own places. First and foremost, I would like to express my deepest thanks to the speakers for sharing their experiences and insight with us today. It has been particularly valuable to hear about the benefits and challenges of using digital technology in the context of each country. I also would like to extend my appreciation to the participants for making the time to join the call today. As we saw today's presentation, digital technologies changing the way in which protected areas are managed. Robots and AI has been to monitor protected areas with unprecedented speed and precision. Big data analysis using communication data has made it possible to see clear the usage behavior of a visitor in protected area. Protected area managers are now preparing to build a smart information system, so-called digital twin, that bring all the data we mentioned together, which will lead to even faster and more efficient management decisions. However, there are still many problems to be solved if digital technology is to prepare its true potential to contribute to the protected area management. Amongst other measures, there will be a need for additional resources and for capacity building of protected area managers. APOP will continue to explore ways in which it can assist in the future, for example, through the Tech for Nature project. In closing, I would like to thank a number of organizations and partners for their support, including Ministry of Environment Korea, Korean National Park Service, Ministry of Environment Japan, and IUCN Hawaii Partnership. Finally, if you should have any remaining question from today's webinar, or would you like to your information, for the information, please do not hesitate to reach out to IOCN and we would be happy to have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ko. And uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the webinar and found it useful. So take care and until our next, uh, our next webinar, bye for now. Thank you, everybody.